Um, I see Michael Chan. Um, can everyone hear me on the chat? Just to make sure everything's working. Uh, a few thumbs up there. All right, awesome, awesome. I see Michael Kong and Simone. Great stuff. All right, so hello and welcome everyone. I'm Alejandro Ferrero, the Google BSC lead at Politecnico de Milano. And I wanna thank you all for joining in today. Um, we, ha we have a fantastic week ahead of us with four exciting events about blockchain. Uh, we'll be exploring some of the most important projects in this industry, as well as their cutting edge technologies. And so today uh, we're starting off this blockchain week with Phantom. And we have the honor to welcome Michael Kong, Michael Chen, and Simone Pomposi from the Phantom Foundation. And uh, they will be guiding us through this amazing project and its ecosystem. So I hope everyone is ready to have a good time as usual. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to the Phantom team so they can get started with the um, event presentation. So I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and you guys should be ready to go. Sounds great. So a little introduction actually uh, before starting about ourselves. So my name is Simone Pomposio, I work in marketing at Phantom. Then we have Michael Kong, Phantom's CEO, and uh, Michael Chen, Phantom's uh, chief marketing officer. Uh, the way that we structured the presentation before starting, it's uh, Michael Chen and I will first do an overview and um, sort of uh, general, um, high-level presentation about Phantom and uh, what we do. And uh, we're also going to do a nice uh, uh, quick demo for uh, transactions and show you how Phantom is, is fast and cheap. That's super cool. And then Michael Kong will take over the presentation to do a more, more technical and in-depth overview of the, um, of the engine of, uh, of Phantom. So I would say we can start uh, with, uh, with the presentation at this point. I will share my screen. And all right, so Phantom High Performance Blockchain Network, and let's dive right into it. Okay, this is a summary for uh, the general non-technical overview of the project, and uh, you're gonna learn what is Phantom, how is Phantom different from other layer one networks, the developer experience on Phantom, and the Phantom ecosystem. Now, first thing, what is Phantom? So Phantom is a fast, scalable, and secure layer one platform built on a permissionless ABFT consensus protocol. We're going to explore more in details what all this means. Before that, I'd like to give you a bit of history about Phantom. So Phantom was founded in 2018 we conducted the sale early that year, and we started developing the platform based on research on consensus mechanism done at the Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea, and at the University of Sydney in Australia. Phantom Mainnet went live on December 27, 2019, and in May 2020, we started working on government projects in the Middle East. Phantom is still early. We're continuing in both development and research on consensus, as well as expanding our enterprise solutions at a government level with different countries. Now let's look at the key features of Phantom. So the first one is speed. The transactions are confirmed in one to two seconds. The low fees, transaction fees cost a fraction of a cent and EVM compatibility. Developers can deploy smart contracts just like on Ethereum and use the same tools. This is great. You can think of Phantom as a supercharged Ethereum in a way. For those of you who are familiar with Ethereum, you may know that the Ethereum gas fees, the fee that you have to pay for transactions, are very prohibitive at the moment. We're talking 30, 40, $50 per transactions. And with Phantom, you pay a fraction of a cent or $0.001 and transactions are confirmed immediately. Now, the core architecture of Phantom. Phantom is composed of three layers specifically designed for high volumes, precise execution, and interoperability. 
Let's see what these three layers are. The base layer is the consensus mechanism. Phantom's consensus mechanism is called Lachesis. It's an ABFT, asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant consensus. More on that later. And in simple terms, it's a gossip about gossip protocol. Let's see with an example how transactions are transmitted across the network. In Lachesis, a network participant, let's call her Alice, will tell another participant, let's call him Bob, picked at random, all the information she knows so far. Alice will keep doing the same with different random participants, and Bob and all the other participants will do the same as well. This way, if a single participant becomes aware of new information, it will spread exponentially fast through the community until every participant is aware of it. That's neat. It's yeah, gossip about gossip. So they hear something, they repeat it to someone else, and that's how transactions uh, and information can be spread very fast across the network. Now, Lachesis is asynchronous. The participants have the freedom to process comments at different times. For example, transactions get confirmed as soon as they enter the network. There's no waiting for block confirmations like on Bitcoin. It's fast and, and inexpensive. As we saw, transactions are final in one to two seconds and cost a fraction of a cent. It's secure. It supports one third of faulty nodes and it's leaderless. No participant plays a special role. There's no round robin like on practical BFT or an elected council of nodes or anything like that. Then there's the middle layer, the middleware. The middle layer is EVM compatible and fully interoperable, which means that developer can instantly deploy smart contracts written in Solidity or Viper, taking advantage of the blazing speed and the security of Lachesis. In the past couple of months, we saw protocols such as SushiSwap, Yearn, Cover, Cream, Keeper V1, Frax, and many others deploying on Phantom. It was easy because once again, Phantom is fully compatible with Ethereum. Since it's also cheaper and faster, developers really liked interacting with Phantom. And the top layer, the fun stuff, also known as the application layer. This is where end users interact with the network. It can be through smart contracts, dApps, decentralized applications, and on-chain governance that makes Phantom even more decentralized. In fact, all network decisions at this stage are made through governance proposals. Being a proof-of-stake network, FTM stakers can vote on proposals based on their preference and on the amount of FTM that they own. Now, the key takeaways so far. Phantom is high performance. It's a closed platform EVM. It uh, so one to two seconds finality and 0.0001 dollar fees. Phantom is scalable. It can scale up to hundreds of nodes and reach two to three thousand transactions per second. Even if tra transactions per seconds aren't really a meaningful metric. TTF, or time to finality, is a much better metric to define the speed and latency of a network. And Phantom is secure. It's blockchain-based, so as you know, it's an immutable ledger. It's tamper-proof. It's always accessible anytime and anywhere. It's a leaderless proof-of-stake protocol with distributed nodes, so it doesn't depend on one centralized entity. If a node or more, no or more nodes go down, the network stays alive. Lastly, Phantom has a two-pronged approach. This is very interesting and it's not very common in, in the blockchain space. So we have an on-chain uh, development and enterprise development as well. The profits from the enterprise solutions fund on-chain development, which in turn enhances the enterprise solution with its innovation and research. The on-chain progress includes governance, as we talked, Fluid staking. For the first time on a layer one network, the value of the staked tokens isn't locked. In fact, user, users can mint a synthetic token that represents their staked value and use that in the DeFi ecosystem of Phantom. That's super cool. 
then there's all the various steps, including our own phantom finance, an all-in-one DeFi suite for trading, lending, and borrowing. Then there's NFTs, there, there are consensus mechanism improvements, and much more. On the other side, we have the enterprise solutions. So secure databases, for example, for national e-health, cleaning and settlement of financial instruments, transparent public or private ERP enterprise resource planning and MIS management information systems solutions, supply chain transparency and verification, modern market exchanges, secure certification issuance, and central bank digital currencies. These enterprise solutions, most of them are actually active in pilot programs in the Middle East, and we're working on many more to come. Now I let my colleague Michael Chen, Phantom CMO, to continue the presentation. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Simone, for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit uh, about Phantom and what we do. So just let me pull up the presentation for a second as I have technical difficulties. No problem. Can you guys see it? Yes. Fantastic, man. So first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit more about what Phantom is and how it's different from other layer one networks. Obviously, Simone, you've already given a bit of an overview of the two-pronged approach and the enterprise stuff. I'd kind of like to dig into the asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerance a little bit more because I think people need a bit of context about the Byzantine general's problem and why asynchronous systems are inherently more scalable or at least faster than synchronous versions of them. So just want to cut it down into three categories, I think, how Phantom is different, some of these which are technical and some of which are mostly cultural and visionary, right? So out of these three, uh, I'd say the very heart of the network, which is the ABFT consensus, is the biggest innovation on a technical level. And then second and thirdly, I guess, is mostly on a cross-chain standards level. And I mean, those two are a bit intertwined, right? Because as soon as you start talking about cross-chain and, well, how you work together with Ethereum, uh, you need cross-chain standards to be working together with Ethereum in the first place or to be bridging assets. So those two will probably... Uh, be encompassed into a single uh, piece of piece of chat. But uh, first, I would like to start with the consensus mechanism, right? And not about how fast it is or any of that, but more on an ideological level here, right? Because I think ABFT consensus or just BFT consensus in general um, has been built by other teams and by other blockchain networks as well and has been hooked up to all kinds of things, right? But for Phantom, we came into the space a couple of years ago as Ethereum fanboys. We started developing there. We started building applications on it. And we never really came in with this antagonistic or tribalistic kind of mentality where we said, oh, we have to kill Ethereum and steal all their users and then rebuild from scratch. That's not how we work, right? We always said, whenever we build something, even if it's a layer one network that would so-called be competing with Ethereum, we want to make sure that there's backwards compatibility. And that's also why the Ethereum virtual machine is hooked up to our consensus so that anyone coding in Solidity or Viper and any work that anyone has been done could be repurposed or could easily be forked by another individual or team. Now, just want to take into the BFT part, right? Because not everybody here knows what Byzantine fault tolerance is. And Simone, you obviously already mentioned the beautiful part of Byzantine fault tolerance is that it's actual true finality, right? So whereas on Bitcoin, we use the longest chain rule. So for example, we have probabilistic finality where we say after six blocks have been mined, the chance that the reorg is going to happen is going to be incredibly, infinitesimally small. With BFT networks, you don't need that probabilistic finality. As soon as nodes come to consensus, you could say this has happened and this could never change. And that's the wonderful part because it enables applications that re require significant, significant UX where you can't wait an hour for block confirmations or in that case, a couple minutes on Ethereum. And the way it achieves that, it actually uses this really interesting theory back from the last century called the Byzantine generals problem. And they used warfare to kind of explain how that worked. So imagine like three smaller nations trying to attack a bigger nation 
and they can only win if two thirds of those nations, so two out of these three, attack at the same time. And that kind of introduced this really, really interesting communication problem, right? Because if you have a nation in the middle with three smaller nations around it, you would have to send your pigeon through enemy territory, for example, to communicate with one another. And as you may know, if you think of that enemy nation as a sort of some kind of network, in networks, there's malicious actors, there's hostile people, there's baddies, basically. And you send your pigeon through and it can get sh shut down or your message can get intercepted. And what could happen because of it is these three nations would not then not all be attacking at the same time and then lose, which essentially would mean they would have come to consensus. So as a means to this end, right, we wanted to build a network with which didn't just work well in adversarial setting, like the, in the Byzantine general sec, uh, side of things, where, uh, for example, messages get intercepted, people are bad, nodes go offline, and so forth, but also in a loosely connected setting, right? When you introduce latency, when you introduce further levels of distribution in a geographical or on a server level, and so forth, which we think is really, really exciting and something Michael Kong can probably give more of an idea about. Now, I think on the cross-chain level, right, uh, there's a lot of cross-chain talk going on between a lot of the different blockchains, and there's also different forms of it, right? So usually when we talk about cross-chain, there's a, two different things, right? On one hand, you've got tangible economic value, like digital assets, tokens, Bitcoin, and all of that being wrapped on different chains. But you've also got intangible kind of value, right? Like data and data that's actually powering other applications of financial value, but that you can very difficultly uh, put a price tag on, right? So on the latter, we've got Oracle sub providers like Chainlink and Band Protocol, which are focused on that. We are mostly focused on the actual asset wrapping and we're working together with a cool bridge solutions on that. And what's mostly important here, right, is that we're bridging heterogeneous blockchains to one another because obviously on other networks like Cosmos and Polkadot, which are two big blockchain pro projects, they already have some kind of interoperability baked onto networks which are built on top of their SDK. So these things are already interoperable with each other, so to say. So for us, what really makes sense is to bridge into these ecosystems and then by proxy, we'd also be bridging into all the other ecosystems directly too, which is quite exciting, I think. And the way we achieve that essentially is usually through some kind of distributed key management or multi-party computation, what we call it where we essentially have multiple actors which come together and can then share a private key essentially of a wallet without any of these nodes or actors having access to the complete private key and being able to behave maliciously. And here the same BFT principles apply that you need a super majority, which is more than two thirds to recompile that private key. And that's quite exciting uh, because what it allows us to do is essentially to create a wallet which is held by a distributed amount of actors, and then you can send assets in there on, for example, Bitcoin, and on the other side on Phantom, Ethereum, or any other chain like that, you could then wrap a token or like mint an IU, which is called Phantom BTC or wrapped BTC or whatever you want to call it, which can then be traded on that other side or be transferred while still being one-on-one -on -one pegged to the asset on the other side, because it's always going to be one by one backed and it's always going to be in that wallet. And the only way that can be messed with is if all these nodes and all these wall, uh, bridge operators start colluding. Um, more about that later, by the way, just for the purpose of this presentation, want to keep the pace in here. Uh, and I mean, I already said before that point two and three were intertwined, right? Because at the end of the day, uh, cross chain is exciting. Uh, it's exciting to connect blockchains with each other that normally wouldn't be connected with each other. But at the end of the day, that's only interesting if there's any economic value that can be bridged, right? Because I'm not going to be bridging to a chain that has no users or a chain that has no assets. And if you look at users and assets and network effects, the biggest chain right now that you can't go around is Ethereum, right? I mean, there's a multi-billion dollar DeFi space in there. There's new projects and users coming in every day. And we always ask ourselves, how do we work together with Ethereum in a symbiotic way and not an antagonistic way where we say, oh, we have to kill it, we have to destroy it, and we have to somehow rebuild what they are doing, right? How do you use your traction to grow your own ecosystem? And I guess there's a couple key factors here that make Phantom suitable as a layer two for Ethereum, essentially, or as an economic testnet or whatever you want it to be. 
because first of all, to be interoperable with Ethereum, I guess, and to get these assets over and to redeploy the same contracts, you have to be EVM compatible, which is the first requirement. And well, in terms of EVM compatibility, there's a couple networks out there. There's Binance Smart Chain. There is, I think, Avalanche, Avax C Chain, which is also EVM compatible. And back in the day, you had Tomo Chain and One Chain. And I think what makes Phantom suitable, even though it's an EVM net based network like just like those, it's the series of traits that 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 people and developers ideologically resonate with so in terms of our network anybody can come in and run a validator node right anyone can participate in the governance of the network right so there's no councils there's no well weird seats or chairman being selected or any of that right it's quite leaderless in that sense and there's dynamic participation so just Getting in isn't just permissionless, but also getting out of the network is quite easy, so which allows uh, a constant change in the network architecture and, and, and its participants, which is quite fantastic in my opinion. Um, furthermore, right, I'd say what, what else has been really, really beneficial for Phantom is also the fact that we've kept things quite clean compared to other chains, right? So we never got busy with weird anonymous forks. We never focused on building the applications on top of our own chain, right? We were always focused on maintaining that brick layer infrastructure and giving developers tools that they really, really want to use, which brings me to my next point, right? Because Ethereum at the end of the day is not just a tech stack. Uh, I, mean, I mean, of course, Solidity is cool, Viper is cool, all these programming languages and, and, and all the applications built on top of them are also really, really cool. But what, what at the end of the day, what makes Ethereum Ethereum is not technical superiority, right? At the end of the day, it's network effects and other infrastructure that people have been building on top of it over the years. So if you look at a normal developer's job and their workflow, usually when they start deploying applications, they test locally, of course. And there's a couple of cool suites that allow you to do that, like Brownie, Truffle, Ganache, Remix, and Hardhat, which aren't necessarily natively supported or out of the box for these other networks. Well, I'm excited to say to you that on Phantom, all of these are natively supported. We're very close to these teams and they uh, have enabled native support for Phantom so that when developers download those uh, testing environments, set that up, they'll see Ethereum, they'll see Ethereum test nets, and then they'll see Phantom to be building with. And on many other fronts, that's the same case, right? I mean, when you're talking about wallets, if you're, what will you say sorry, that's my Siri and my phone. When you're dealing with wallets, for example, right? When you're holding economic value, when you hold phantom tokens in your wallet, you don't want to be downloading something new. You don't want to set up a new private key. You don't want to get a new password, right? If you could, you would like to reuse what you already have. And that's the beautiful of EVM compatible networks as well, because essentially all you have to change on MetaMask is you have to change a chain ID, you've got to cat a custom RPC and API URL, and you've got to add an explorer that you want to be using, and you're pretty much ready to go with the exact same wallet you've been using on Ethereum. And well, I think that's really, really powerful, right? Because back in the day, if you look at 2017 and 18, when people were building blockchains, everyone was making their own wallets. Everyone was making their own explorers. Now, if you imagine there's 20, 30 EVM compatible chains building their own explorers and wallets, imagine how much money went to waste when in fact the best wallet out there was always already here, which was MetaMask. And just skipping through these slides because we discussed that already. And I think more importantly, um, well, talking about an explorer, right? Explorers aren't just, aren't just a piece of UX that you use to check transactions on chain, right? For a developer and Explorer is much more because if you look at decentralized finance, if you look at blockchain, it's an inherently inclusive and open space, right? So if I deploy an application today, it's very easy for you to deploy an application using my application as a Lego block to build something bigger for you tomorrow. And well, to do that, you don't want to be using unverified contracts, right? Like, like, like I want to make sure that if I'm using a contract to build an app that what they've uploaded, what they've deployed on chain actually matches the source code on your GitHub, which is something that only one explorer really does effectively, which is Etherscan. And well, when we were getting an explorer done, we said, hey, we're not going to build our own. 
uh, we're going to have ethos can do our R, so the feel, the vibe, and the functionality would be the exact same. So the developers coming into Phantom would have access to Everscan to do verified contracts, would have all the local and uh, online testing and development environments, and that they would have access to a wallet that they are familiar with to interact with the actual chain. So in short, that's a little bit about the, the benefits of using Phantom and the ease of developing on top of it. But I guess on top of that, we probably wouldn't be where we are today without the partners we have, right? Because obviously, we aren't going to rebuild blockchain API query, uh, query software. We aren't going to be rebuilding oracles, and we aren't going to be rebuilding DeFi applications ourselves. I mean, instead of doing that, we're focused on maintaining the bricklayer infrastructure, and we're motivating those teams to build it on top of them because they breathe their niche. So when we talk about APIs, for example, we only work together with best-in-class API providers such as DeGraph and Covalent, and DeGraph being a, 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 a platform that allows you to host uh, subgraphs, which are essentially like small databases of specific applications on top of the blockchain, where they index all the events and transactions and wallets interacting with each other to give you data you can then action to build a significant U significantly better user experiences. And Covalent being a complete indexing protocol, which indexes the entire chain, for example, to allow you to build cool wallets, for example, that have data and could uh, give you pie charts, for example, so you can see your DeFi uh, holdings and different uh, compositions of your portfolio. Now, on the Oracle side of things, right, this is something very, very scary for us. Uh, this is also not something we wanted to be building before because as you may know, oracles are inherently built to feed off-chain data, which is always going to be a little bit scary on-chain. And as soon as it does come on-chain, it's intemperable and it's quite, um, yeah, it's 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 quite much there, right? And well, we work together with Chainlink and Band Protocol to be able to provide our developers with Opera native, Phantom native uh, oracles and price feeds to ensure that developers. Uh, get the best quality of data to feed into their applications. Yeah, so we'll give the microphone to Michael Kong, and we could probably dig into the Q&A a little bit more on these specific things. Sounds good. And uh, before that, actually, shall we show a couple of transactions back and forth to actually see the, the speed and the, and the cost of transactions on Phantom? There would be... I think a really good segue between our presentation and, uh, and Michael Kong technical presentation. Yeah, that sounds good. So Simone, I think you've prepared some wallets, right? That, uh, the test wallets to show people a little bit how Phantom Mainnet interacts. Yes. Yeah, Let so me... I'll turn off my screen sharing then so you can screen share. Yes, let me pull it up real quick. Okay, so I'm going to share, let's see. Hmm. Okay, so this is our uh, wallet, Phantom wallet, it's, uh, it's pretty cool, we're also uh, working on a new version to to address a lot of um, user feedback, which is has been really really cool. Uh, so, can you also see the um, the MetaMask here? Yes. Mm, um, no, I think it's being cut off on the right side. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. It it doesn't matter. Anyway, I just connected MetaMask to the wallet. Of course. We can access our wallet in a few different ways. One is MetaMask, one is with uh, hardware wallets such as Ledger, and the other one is with uh, paper wallet. And uh, so using uh, either the mnemonic or the private key or the key store plus password 
combination. So in this case, I connected using MetaMask. Now let's see, uh, I'm going to send the transaction from this wallet to another wallet that I own. And uh, so send, here I'm gonna send, uh, I'm gonna select the blockchain that I'm gonna use. So it's Phantom Opera. These are the two Ethereum Binance chain. It's because Phantom token also lives both on Ethereum and Binance chain. So it's a three standard token. Uh, of course, the benefits of Phantom, such as the uh, very low fees and the fast speed, you're all, all only going to get it on uh, on Phantom Opera. And we encourage everyone to use Phantom Opera at this stage. Um, except, you know, Binance, Binance Chain doesn't really see much usage at, at this point. It was very, very helpful at the beginning when we first listed on Binance, for example. And Ethereum, of course, if uh, users want to use uh, DeFi applications that are just on Ethereum for now, then they can, you know, uh, use the ERC20 version of uh, FTM. Anyway, in this case, let's do uh, send over FTM to a Phantom Opera address. The amount, let's send 10, for example, 10 FTM, which is about, I would say, $4 at the moment. Uh, we could also do much less because this is also something super cool that uh, on Ethereum you can do, but really doesn't make much of a sense. At the moment, I believe that if you want to send $4 uh, worth of Ethereum, you would spend pretty much the same in uh, transaction fees. And that's that's a little bit sad, but it is what it is. Then this is the address that I'm going to send it to. The memo, you can skip it. Then continue. So this is a little bit of recap. Send to this wallet, send from my wallet, amount 10 FTM. Oops, let me switch it. Okay, in MetaMask, apologies for that. There we go. Now, MetaMask, not sure if you can see it, asked me for confirmation. And it's verifying the transaction, and the transaction is sent already. And as you can see, the timestamp is eight seconds ago, and it already has three block confirmations. If I, there you go. So you can see it's super, super fast. And actually, uh, the confirmation that you saw here in the wallet happened after the actual confirmation on the blockchain. So it's really, really fast. But also, this is, I think, something that is even more uh, mind-blowing in a way, you know, compared to what we're used to with uh, with other chain. Ethereum, but also non-Ethereum uh, or ev other EVM-based blockchain that certainly don't <laughs> don't have these sort of uh, transaction fees. They, they're usually much, much higher. So to send this, uh, you know, $4 worth of Phantom, I only spent 0 0.000046 dollars. So it's pretty much free. Uh, free. It's, uh, yeah, it's incredible. Um, so, yeah, so one minute, 26 blocks, com block confirmations already. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I would say this was, uh, this was the small, uh, the little uh, transaction demo. I, I could do more, but, you know, it's just the same. You, you would see uh, exactly the same thing. Actually, um this maybe has not been uh, fully communicated uh, before, but uh, I believe with Alejandro, we discussed of airdropping a small amount of FTM to the first, I believe, 25 people that um, um, that signed up for, uh, for this event. So you guys will be able to uh, test this out uh, on yourself. And actually, as developers, it, it's great because you can deploy smart contracts, which so you know, with the same fees or comparable fees that you saw me sending the, the transaction. It's going to be a little bit more, but we're still talking fraction of cents compared to a lot of money on, on Ethereum. So that's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm excited for you guys to, to try it out in the first person. So at this point, I'll leave it to Michael Kong and the technical presentation. That's going to be very, very fun. Um, thanks so much, Michael Chen, um, for your presentations. Um, so um, let me just share my screen now. Um, oh. 
Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. So, um, you know, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the organizers and uh, for you guys for attending um, uh, this session with us. Uh, um, you know, really, really appreciate um, you know, your interest and uh, your support. Um, so my name is Mark Kong. I'm the CEO of Phantom. And today I wanted to go over um, um, a bit of a technical, but not too much of a technical presentation um, about some common concepts when it comes to, I guess, distributed ledgers and consensus, as well as, um, you know, our current stack that we call Lachesis, and also a bit about what we're, um, an upgrade that we're pushing through the network actually pretty soon, probably within the next week or so, um, that we now call Go Opera. Um, so first of all, some common uh, concepts to do with um, uh, decentralized blockchain protocols or distributed ledger technology. Um, so first one is um, the consensus algorithm. Um, Simone and Michael Chen kind of um, already talked about this a bit, but essentially what a consensus algorithm is, is coming to a, um, a, a specific order of transactions from the beginning of, you know, basically the chain or the beginning of time to uh, the current state of the chain or to the latest number of transactions. And it's having that ledger with that very specific order that's shared amongst all of the nodes um, in the network. That is what the objective of a consensus algorithm is. So, you know, there's a lot of work and research gone into, you know, the most efficient way or safest way um, to, to come to that sort of consensus while also making sure that it's Byzantine fault tolerant. In other words, if some part of the network experiences a failure, um, that it's not going to bring the whole consensus down where transactions can't be confirmed by the network. So, you know, in consensus algorithms, you're basically dealing with two types of nodes. Um, you're dealing with honest nodes. So they're like the good nodes um, that basically, um, you know, uh, communicate um, their set of um, transactions with other nodes in the network. And those nodes trust those nodes. Um, and there's also malicious actors or nodes that, you know, will try and come to the consensus um, in a different manner to the majority of the network. So, you know, how does the network determine what honest and dishonest nodes are? Um, it really does it. Um, well, it kind of depends on the consensus algorithm. But when it comes to go uh, like he says, um, it does so by uh, getting a super majority of, of of the total valid name power, power of the network. In other words, two thirds of the network plus one. So nodes that participate that are part of that two thirds majority plus one are considered honest nodes. There's other nodes that try to fork, um, they try to submit a different set of transactions to the majority, uh, they get labeled as cheaters and they basically get pruned from the network um in what we call the next epoch which i'll get into and those nodes um also get penalized where they lose a portion possibly you know their entire stake that they're put onto the network so that's sort of um how that that that's sort of what we mean by um honest and dishonest nodes um because obviously you know we don't really know um who's running nodes um unless they confer themselves publicly you know who's running nodes in the background, if it's a certain individual in a certain country or a certain organization, the network doesn't really care about that. The, the network determines it's in a different manner to that. Um, so there's basically two types of, um, um, there's two types of consensus algorithms. And when it comes to um, consensus algorithms, there's kind of a trade-off in terms of, you know, um, different characteristics of, of a distributed ledger. <clears throat> um, so in terms of these two types of algorithms that we're talking about, um, we've got algorithms that kind of favor fast finality or, or achieving uh, um, consensus when it comes to transactions as quickly as possible over what we call liveness or the ability for the network to stay online if there is some sort of fault with the network. So, you know, uh, like he says, or asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms in general, uh, are the first one where they favor finality over liveliness. Um, other types of blockchains um, that focus on probabilistic Byzantine fault tolerance, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, they tend to favor um, availability over finality. So there are advantages and different disadvantages of these two types of algorithms. 
So the advantages of, you know, once a favor finality over liveliness is that of course, you know, um, it can be a lot faster um, uh, to achieve finality um, with, with a, um, a small enough set of nodes um, because as soon as uh, the nodes get entered in the network, they can confirm as quickly as possible between they get communicated or gossiped with other nodes in the network as quickly as possible, as opposed to um, say Bitcoin, where you gotta wait um, on average 10 minutes for the next block to be um, mined and added to the ledger. Um, when it comes to ABFT algorithms, that's not really the case. Um, also requires a super majority of participants, uh, to be honest, that two thirds plus one, um, which is what allows it to achieve finality um, uh, compared to probabilistic uh, business or tolerant algorithms. Um, it's also easy to determine which nodes are malicious um, because if they're not part of the super majority, we label them as malicious. And, and nodes, that are, that nodes that are labeled as malicious get penalized. There are some disadvantages though. That is, you know, if you don't have a super majority of consensus, if you have, you know, uh, one third or less, um, sorry, if uh, one third or more of the network you know, doesn't agree with the rest of the network, then, you know, the network effectively um, can't come to consensus about any transactions going forward. It's essentially, you know, it's essentially a denial of service. Where it comes to um, um, consensus algorithms um, that, um, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum use, you know, there can be any N number of miners with any, you know, amount of validating power between themselves. You know, there, there can be, you know, there can be one miner, there can be a thousand miners, there can be 10,000 miners. You know, the network doesn't really care um, because the difficulty level of the network adjusts according to the amount of hashing power that's added into the network. So it doesn't require two thirds of participants to be honest all of the time. You know, it only requires half of the network to be honest all of the time. So, um, obviously the, the disadvantages are, you know, in terms of speed, so finality, you know, on average, you know, for Bitcoin, you know, 10 seconds to get included in a block. If you use six minutes, sorry, six blocks, it's kind of your metric to, you know, basically have, you know, essentially as close to deterministic finality as possible that the, you know, the block isn't gonna, that the blockchain isn't gonna fork where your transaction isn't in um, the other forked blockchain, then you're looking at close to an hour. And in Ethereum, you're looking at like, you know, a few minutes. Um, whereas with um, ABFT algorithms, it can be a, a it can be a lot faster in just ter just in terms of a few seconds. Um, so when we come to uh, when we talk about network performance, um, there's a variety of different numbers that we're talking about, but the main ones that we tend to talk about is known are known as TPS and TTF. So TPF is T TPS um, are transactions per second. So essentially, the number of transactions um, that can be processed by the network, i.e. finality can be achieved per second on average. Um, it essentially um, um, is analogous to network performance. However, you know, there, there are different kinds of transactions. You know, for example, you can have EVM-based transactions. You can have some transactions that are more complex than others. Um, for example, like you may have like a smart contract um, uh, you, you may have a particular transaction that executes a lot of instructions on the Ethereum virtual machine, which is obviously going to be more complicated than a, a direct uh, uh, balance update um, kind of transaction. Um, so when you're always comparing TPS, you always got to look at what kind of transactions are you actually comparing to one another. So that's very, very important. The other number is TTF, um, also known as time to finality. It, it essentially uh, determines how long when a how long it takes from a transaction as soon as it enters into the network to get two thirds plus one confirmation um, by the network itself. In other words, you know, to achieve finality, that there's not going to be some sort of reordering of the chain where the transaction um, somehow gets lost. Um, it's kind of analogous to um, network latency. Um, is kind of the best way to think about it in kind of in kind of generalized networks. Um, there tends to be a trade-off between TPS and TTF because obviously, you know, if, the, um, if TPS is lower, then um, uh, each node um, processes fewer transactions, so they're able to, you know, get through the number of transactions in the process 
um, a lot faster than if there's a much heavier load on the network where, you know, there's only so much, you know, uh, computational power available to each, you know, um, validated in the network. There's only a certain amount of computational power overall in terms of the network. So obviously, you know, that has to be spent, um, you know, that can be spent, you know, processing a transaction faster or that can be spent processing multiple transactions and, um, but all a little bit slower. So for example, you know, a really, really simple example is that you, know, you could have a network that has a time to value of about one second with um, transaction uh, per second, uh, with, with 60 transactions going through the network per second, um, as opposed to a network that handles, say, double that, 120 transactions per second, but um, it takes five seconds to achieve finality. So um, a lot of the work that we've been doing is based on, you know, how do we um, basically optimize the trade-off? How do we make sure that, you know, we can maximize transaction per second while minimizing um, the time to finality? And that's what a lot of the research has essentially been about in terms of network performance. Um, but there's something else we also need to talk about, which is um, P2B protocol, because you know you can't come to consensus if messages you know aren't communicated between nodes to begin with. So um, when we talk about P2B protocol, you know, we're talking about a series of rules about how transactions um, are passed and communicated between nodes, how essentially information is exchanged between nodes. So when it when it comes to um, like Hesis, uh, we use the P2B protocol that's quite well known. Uh, um, you know, it, it's been researched for a few decades now. It's called gossiping about gossip, and you know, it, it, it ensures that you know um, information is able to be passed between the nodes um, essentially as quickly as possible, so uh, consensus or the ordering of the transactions can take place. Um, so you know. Kind of in a bit of a summary in terms of the concepts I've been talking about, you know, there's a P2B protocol, how um, nodes pass messages to one another. There's a consensus algorithm, how nodes come to consensus about the ordering of transactions after they've communicated the transactions to one another, and also um, the application as well. So, you know, what, what, what exactly, what information is exactly within a transaction itself, you know, um, you know, transactions can vary depending on, you know, uh, what sort of, what kind of like execution they're performing, say for example, the virtual machine. Um, now on to more specifically, um, um, Lachesis or our version of APFT consensus. Um, there's a really, really important concept uh, called happens before. You know, um, basically, it, it basically talks about, you know, um, the ordering of transaction. So how do we make sure that, you know, one transaction knows that you know, uh, you know, and you know, another transaction preceded it, um, and so on and so forth, till you get to the beginning of the network. You know, it's really, really important that you always have that ordering, um, the correct, a hundred percent correct, not ninety nine point nine percent correct, but hundred percent correct between all of the nodes in the network, because that's what we call consensus. If there's any um, this discrepancy. That means that you know you open yourself up to you know, you know double spending. You've opened yourself up to you know inconsistencies where you know people's balances may vary between the nodes, and that obviously you know cannot happen in a network. Everything has to be consistent. So with APG um, algorithms, it's really really challenging, um, you know, in order to get you know uh, um, a, a final ordering of the transactions. And the first step in order to do that is, um, you know, figuring out um, um, a timestamp for each and every transaction, because obviously the ordering needs to be done on the tra on the on the timestamp. Um, you know, there has to be an event that happened earlier, and there can be events that happen afterwards as well. Um, so there's kind of two algorithms that we use, uh, or concepts that we use that have been researched um, for quite a while now, and just in general in terms of like cases. You know, it, it consists of a lot of different um, concepts in, distri in distributed computing, a lot of different algorithms that have actually existed for quite some time now. What, we, what we've done is kind of um, researched them quite heavily and kind of put them in together to form kind of one consensus network. So, you know, two um, ways we achieve, um, you know, a timestamp is via um, what we call lamp or timestamps and vector clocks. Um, so these are kind of two techniques that allow us to quickly sort between um, events to make sure that we've at least got some ordering. 
So when we use these two concepts, we create something what's known as a partially ordered set or a posit. <laughs> um, so a partially ordered set, yeah, is a set that yeah, it, 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 it's ordered um, to some degree, uh, but not to all degree. And when we have a posit, we need to somehow get to a linear order um, ordering of events because we have to have a linear ordering um, exactly the same, which is exactly the same concept um, in all other consensus algorithms, whether it's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tendermint, or others. You know, in the end, you need to get some sort of ordering of the transactions. Um, even though there may be some um, malicious actors in the network. So this is based on an example of um, happens before, uh, before relation and how we basically um, start be, uh, building the DAG. Um, and, and just a quick um, um, description about like what a DAG is. So DAG is a directed asynchronous graph. It's a graph where you know um, there's um, there's a direction between the nodes or between events, which which makes sense intuitively because you know one event has to occur you know, earlier than other. You kind of um, one event in the future happening earlier than uh, an event that happened in the past. <laughs> you know, so all um, all nodes or uh, all events in a graph have to be directed, right? It also has to be acyclic because you can't have cycles in the graph because if you have a cycle in the graph, you don't know um, necessarily which event <laughs> happened first. You know, it could it could be that any um, event in you know in, in the cycle happened first. Um, as opposed to um, some other event in it. So it, it strictly has to be acyclic in order to know exactly which transactions happen first um, after others. So this is why all um, a, 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 B, T consensus have to um, create a directed acyclic graph when it comes to the ordering of events. Um, technically a blockchain, you know, which is then essentially a linear ordering of blocks uh, is also a DAG as well. So, you know, uh, um, you know, you, you can't go backwards in in terms of you know um, the, uh, the, the blockchain tr transactions happen sequentially from left to right. So yeah, it, it's the same concept here as well. <laughs> so with our consensus, you know, we've tried to achieve um, three main things with our consensus. Um, first of all, we're leaderless. So you know, um, our consensus is proof of stake based. So Anybody can join and leave the network when they want to. Um, anybody can, um, you know, set up a validator node, you know, and can confirm transactions in exactly the same way as any other validator on the network. Where the only difference is between, you know, the performance of your node in terms of your hardware, uh, your networking capacity, as well as how much you're staking as well. So this is kind of opposed to um, other forms of consensus such as um, DPoS or delegated proof of stake. Where, for example, on EOS, you know, you have already like um, a selected group of nodes. I think it's about thirty, you know, and that's fixed. Where you know only those nodes can propose new blocks, and only those nodes can validate transactions. You know, for our network, anybody with a computer that can fulfill the minimum requirements uh, to launch a node can launch a node by themselves. They they don't need permission from anybody else. So you know, that's a very very important concept. We think in terms of decentralization. Um, the, other, the other property is that, you know, is asynchronous. So validators can basically emit events, you know, they can, you know, communicate to other nodes um, anytime that they want. As soon as they get transactions um, sent to them, they can emit those transactions or emit those events um, to any other nodes in the network. Um, you know, there's no restriction on that at all. You know, as opposed to, for example, say Tendermint, where there's a dedicated um, time span for finalizing a block. Uh, which increases each round, so that kind of impacts on performance. Or you know, when it comes to like um, um, to probabilistic uh, BFT algorithms like Bitcoin and Ethereum, <coughs> um, where you know, you, uh, basically you know, the miners have to um, um, you know solve a puzzle in order to validate a transaction. They can't just emit transactions themselves. They have to first mine the block. Uh, um, and of course, it has to be um, visiting vault tolerant and be able to achieve finality. So, as kind of previously described before, you know, um, you need two thirds plus one of the total validating power of the network. So, it essentially, is um, you know, validating power is essentially you know um, the amount of FTM in the network. So, you need to have two thirds plus one 
of you know FTM on the network across the validators coming to consensus. And um, we also have the concept of um, epochs as well. So epochs are essentially a way of like um, optimizing the performance of the network. So um, after a, a given number of transactions or a, a given amount of time in the network, approximately four hours, you know, of all the transactions or events emitted and uh, and the DAG that's created out of them, they get sealed. They essentially get packaged up to a single block. And then that block is connected to uh, uh, to the next epoch that is created. So that means that like transactions in a given epoch can't be changed at all by any of the nodes, even if that work, for example, became you know 80% malicious. Um, and it also means that we can uh, prune a, a lot of data related to the earlier transactions because the ordering is already complete for those transactions. So it's kind of, you can kind of think about it as like another level of finality um, um, on top of it as well. Um, so like he says, um, achieves a low time to, time to finality, um, approximately uh, three times the network latency um, of, the, of the entire network. Um, you know, currently we've, we've been experiencing on mainnet finality of around one second. Um, but to be honest, that's kind of because um, we don't have like thousands of transactions going through the network. I think if we have thousands of transactions going through the network, you know, the finality would be probably um, a few more seconds faster than that, right? Maybe like two, three, four seconds after that, which is kind of all right with that sort of trade-off because finality, you know, really is about like user experience, right? So, you know, if a user is willing to wait, you know, a few seconds in order for, for the transaction to be confirmed, for example, if they're paying for something, you know, um, that's kind of all right. They don't necessarily need it to be done in say like 0.1 of a second. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, the time to finality, you know, it really is, you know, about the user in the end, right? Because we don't want the user waiting, you know, 10 minutes for the transaction to be finished or 20 minutes or even maybe like a minute, right? Because that will impact, you know, in terms of the ability to kind of use the network for whatever applications they built. So, you know, if we can get time to finale down to a few seconds while still having very high network throughput, then that's exactly where we want to be. Um, you know, other BFT algorithms you know, can kind of achieve a lower time to finality as well. Uh, but specifically like he says, how do we achieve it? Well, we achieve it through, um, um, through ABFT as I've kind of described before. Um, but in addition to that, events that are, um, events that are communicated in like cases, um, they basically um, react to the, the, the rest of the performance of the network. So for example, if the network latency increases, i.e. if the time to finality increases, um, validators can slow down the emission rate in order to you know, uh, try and um, reduce that network latency and process you know, fewer transactions per second, which is ideal if the network is experiencing fewer transactions per second at that particular point in time. You know, it's not fixed as opposed to like, say like the Bitcoin and Ethereum, where you know, on Bitcoin, you gotta wait on average you know, 10 minutes for a block to be mined, or Ethereum where it's about 13 or 16 seconds. You know, the network can kind of adjust in terms of the trade-off between um, uh, TPS and TTF. Um, conventional BFT algorithms like Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, they finalize blocks one by one. They have to get mined. In like he says, each event um, goes around, um, gets confirmed multiple times to get finalized into a block. And you know, th this is kind of similar to you know parallelization when it comes to uh, computing as well. In that you know, multiple um, events can be um, can be confirmed and emitted um, simultaneously. Um, so, like he says, um, as I described before, favors finality over liveliness. Um, so, you know, algorithms that you know favor liveliness of, over finality, you know, they do have a number of advantages um, over like he says. You know, as I mentioned before, it's a bit of a trade off. Um, but the fact that it's hard to achieve finality without, say, you know, multiple blocks in the chain, you know, that really, really impacts on user ability you know this is why like exchanges you know require say six blocks you know uh, before you know they confirm your deposit or 12 blocks before they confirm your deposit 
because I want to make absolutely sure that you know if you're transacting, if you're depositing a large um, any amount of money, particularly a large amount of money, that you know there's going to be some sort of reorg on the chain in the meantime, which means that you know um, uh, you know the money that you've deposited necessarily you know um, uh, didn't didn't happen on another chain or you know, there are instances where they record that you've made a deposit when um, that transaction is kind of lost on chain, you know, which is why they can't confirm you know, these transactions, you know, with just one block confirmation. They've got to use multiple to make sure that's the case. That's a real disadvantage, you know, of these algorithms that favor liveness over finality. Um, there are also um, um, algor um, algorithms that we call LF, you know, they have like a layer one that kind of favor you know finality over liveness and um layer two algorithms that favor liveness of finality so an example of that is ethereum 2.0 where you know, there are still miners but you can also stake as well you know th there's essentially two layers to that um you know you've got to argue that there is an improvement to that as well uh but there are still some trade-offs to that however <laughs> you know there will still be a higher time to finality uh, because there's two layers as opposed to one it is a bit more complicated to interact with uh, because again there's two layers rather than one and you know there's additional complexity from the user because they had to understand how both layers work um, in order to participate in that so even with something like ethereum 2.0 you could argue there's net improvements but there are still trade-offs as well and just a couple of slides on um, um to go opera as well which is an upgrade that we're pushing out in about a week or two um, so what is GoOpera? Uh, basically, it's a blockchain node that um, provides compatibility with the Ethereum virtual machine and web free APIs. So you know, the way that the stack works is that you know you've got um, you know our our base layer GoOpera, you have the EVM on top, you have the application layer on top, and because it's fully EVM compatible, the way that you compile, write, and deploy smart contracts on um, Ethereum works exactly the same way as us. Um, as on our network as well. Um, in order to um, um, in order to uh, either, you know come to consensus, you need to have two, you need to um, you know um, have timestamps, right? Um, so there's the creation timestamp and the median timestamp. <clears throat> the creation timestamp you know doesn't really matter when it comes to consensus. Um, so that can be determined by a validator um, it, itself. It's not really important in terms of like uh, the network overall. What's really, really important um, um, in order to achieve an ordering of transactions is a medium timestamp. Uh, the medium timestamp, there's an algorithm to calculate that, where it's essentially like a weighted medium between um, uh, different nodes um, in, in the network. And in order for you know, uh, the medium timestamp to be uh, manipulated in some way, um, you need to have about half the net total validating power of the network to include um, on that. And you know that is a risk to the network. However, you know, given that you you only need like uh, one third of the network in order to you know uh, basically uh, you know deny service to it, you know this you know requiring half of the network in order to manipulate timestamp is kind of an acceptable trade off in our opinion. Uh, we also have the concept of chain migrations um, <clears throat> because it each block is final in like he says you know. We can automatically uh, start new chains after certain conditions are met. Um, this means that you know, we can uh, prune some data about uh, um, about these blocks or about these epochs. For example, like like um, indexing of particular events, and then um, you know it, it, it allows us to basically um, synchronize new peers a lot faster than having to download all the chain data. So it's kind of a similar concept to you know to being able to fast sync on say Ethereum. Or Bitcoin or other networks as well. <laughs> so we've recently uh, migrated our testnet um, to incorporate um, our Go Opera, um, which is a much more improved version of Go Lachesis. And thanks everybody for listening to the presentation. Um, some details there about you know websites, some more technical documentation, some technical um, papers that we've written that we've published on archive and elsewhere. And also, if you guys are kind of interested in working with us, you know, in terms of technical capacities or non-technical capacities, um, you know, uh, feel free to reach out to us as well. And thank you very much again for uh, listening to our presentations.
Thank you, Michael, um, and thank you, Simone, and, and thank you, Michael Chen, as well. Uh, this was really insightful, really interesting to learn more about Phantom. Uh, I'm sure that all the participants uh, enjoyed the, the presentation. And as Michael Chen said, uh, the Phantom team will be sharing the, the presentation slide with us so we can later on share it in our Telegram group. So I'm pretty sure that I shared the Telegram link in there for everyone that is interested in joining in and we'll be sharing uh, any other information that the Phantom team wants to, uh, to share with our community and that way we can all stay in touch. Now I am going to leave it for the uh, Q&A. There seems to be one question and Simone and Michael uh, can handle it. If uh, you guys can read it out loud so that later on in the recording, people know what we're talking about, that, that would be awesome. Yeah, sounds good. So the, the question is from uh, Rodolfo. And uh, the question is, is it a concern for the Phantom team that on-chain governance method, um, the amount of FTM stake deter determines uh, voting power may lead to a few big addresses making decisions in the network almost alone? Is there a real impractical solution for it? Thanks. So this is the, um, the question. And uh, well, um, let me let me go over real quick and I'm also gonna share the screen and then I will also send the link later on uh, regarding what I'm gonna talk about right now. It's uh, how our on-chain governance works. So first thing being a proof of stake, of course, um, you know, it, it's fair that those actors that have more at stake have more voting power. It would be unfair, right? Right. Let's see. Let's make a, an example. Let's say that um, Alice holds one percent of the of the voting power. Uh, oh, sorry, of the FTM of the network. It is fair that she has one percent of the voting power. It wouldn't be fair to do otherwise because again her uh she she has economic value at stake in the network and that's used to um to secure the network itself so it's a kind of intertwined it's it's not really just uh you know holding a certain amount of ftm now um the on-chain governance of phantom is super interesting and i believe it's uh, so to my knowledge is probably the most advanced on-chain governance around um, because, so for a few reasons. So reason one is that um, when a proposal uh, goes live, validators and delegators can vote. Now what happens? At the moment we have more than 40 um, validator nodes. When those validator nodes, they vote both for themselves and for the people they delegated to them. Now, uh, of course, let's say a node called Bob and I delegate it to the, to the node called Bob. Uh, if the node called Bob votes before me, he will get, of course, uh, his preference will be pushed uh, to count in the, in the vote for the, for the proposals. But in the moment that I go vote, and I, I vote in a different way from what the, the node runner voted, then of course the vote will be offset. You know, so whatever he voted with, uh, with the full amount of, of FTM that was on the node, it will be shifted, the amount that I'm using to vote will be shifted from the whole amount to, um, to, from the, pro to the, <laughs> the option that he voted in the proposal to what I want to vote. So it's a very democratic way, but also this ensures that not necessarily uh, all the delegators have to vote for for a proposal. Basically, they're delegating their decision to the node. So at the point, they either um, don't vote, and if they don't vote, the node vote will count for them. If they do vote, then they can, you know, of course, vote for whatever they prefer. So um, uh, now, what I was saying is that. Um, our on-chain governance is quite complex and, uh, and it's pretty great. It's not just a yes and no. Of course, we can have yes and no votes, but um, generally speaking, users can uh, express their level of preference for, for options during a, during a proposal. 
and uh, and basically these uh, these level of agreements go from zero to four. Zero is complete is a disagreement, and then four is maximum agreement. So you can see here that you can. Uh, I mean, it's way more flexible than than a yes or no vote. Uh, for example, what is going on right now? There's a there's. Let me see if I can show it. Um, actually with one of the live proposals because that would be very cool to to show i'm connecting my um my wallet so i can show you live proposal okay can you see the screen already we we can see the phantom blog screen oh okay one second i'm gonna share the other one Okay, so this is uh, actually the the current uh, on-chain proposal, and it's to update the the minimum self-stake for uh, for the node. So right now, to run a node, you need three point one seventy five million FTM, and uh, since the, the the price of the token appreciated quite a bit, the community voiced their concern that it could be a little bit too high. So we put out that proposal, uh, this proposal to, and users can vote, as you can see, you know, the, between four different options. Let's say uh, the first one is uh, 500,000 FTM as the minimum to run a validator node, 750,000 FTM, uh, 1 million FTM, 2 million FTM. Now, what I can do here as a, as a delegator, I can express, as I was saying, my uh, level of preference. So let's say that I really want to uh, I believe that, I don't know, 750,000 FTM is what it should be. So I, I make a, a select fully agreement on that and I select fully disagreement on everything else. And then I can vote. Of course, I can't vote here because you have to be uh, staking your FTM. So just holding FTM in your wallet doesn't make you... Um, eligible uh, for voting you have to stake so participate participating actively in securing the network now what also this kind of format gives you is to express you know different uh, level of, of agreement so let's say that yes i would like that seven seven hundred and fifty uh, thousand ftm would be the minimum but i'm also okay that maybe one million you know maybe should could, could be fine and maybe also a little bit in favor of um, 500,000 FTM, but absolutely not agree with the 2 million. So you can see here that um, you can really express a, uh, a very complex um, kind of decision in uh, regarding the vote. Now, going back to the original question, and I will uh, share again the blog post, and then I will send it also for you guys to to review later. Uh, so we have four uh, templates and the templates uh, vary in base of how the proposal is gonna impact the network. So template one is a general ex executable proposal. So they're very safe, they don't break anything. The requirements aren't very strict. So the minimum turnout, uh, the quorum is 55%. The minimum agreement is 55%. And then we have other proposals, so uh, template two, it's a general call executable proposal with a minimal turnout of 60 and the minimal agreement of 60. And the general delegate call executable, these can execute arbitrary code on behalf of the government's contract. So this is the most strict uh, template for government governance proposal. And the minimal turnout is 90% and the minimum turn agreement is 90%. And then we have a template for that is a sort of um, um, alternate version of the template three. It's a delegate executable call with a verified bytecode. So it, it uses a verifier to check the proposal bytecode matches to a reference. So it's a little bit more safe than, than just a delegate call executable. And in this case, again, the minimum turnout is still 90%, but the minimum agreement is 55%. Now, this is just to give you uh, a general overview of how the, um, the governance works. To go back um, 
to, to the original question. So um, there's really no way to prevent big uh, wallets to, uh, to sort of uh, steer votes in their direction. Now, this is the theory. In practice, uh, Phantom is so decentralized at the moment that there's no single entity that, they, that can control uh, the majority of the votes. Um, if two, three nodes, uh, maybe more than that right now, let's say three, four nodes uh, vote and in, in a specific way and their delegators do not vote, then it's a possibility, but it's, a, it's very, very uh, unlikely that, it, that it's going to happen uh, in, in real life. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very, very long uh, answer to a short question, but so uh, to, to sum it up again, no, there's no way to, to prevent, um, you know, a solution to prevent that a few big addresses make a decision in the network, but at the same time, it's very fair to, uh, you know, to keep it that one-to-one -one ratio between uh, FTM state and voting power. And as well, Phantom is very decentralized, so something like that uh, doesn't really happen. So the FTM is very spread among different uh, actors. Um, thanks so much, Simone. That was yeah. such a comprehensive answer, and I hope it's clear. There's one more. I can read it out loud to you. Um, yeah. What are the minimum requirements to run a validator node? Um, okay. Yeah, and this I, I briefly covered in the in the previous uh, question. However, right now the minimum requirements is to stake self stake three point one seventy five million uh, FTM, which is quite expensive at the moment. So we're talking around, uh, I would say, one point five million dollars worth of FTM. So that's quite quite steep. Of course, that's why we. Uh, we also uh, put up that governance proposal to lower the amount of uh, of FTM required to run a validator node. Of course, keep in mind that these um, these specs were made when we first uh, launched the mainnet, so a year and a half ago. The FTM price was much lower, so back then to run a, a validator node was probably around a hundred thousand dollar worth of phantom. Um, at the same time, you know, of course, we want to make it. Uh, very open as uh, as you know as much as possible, and uh, to have hundreds of nodes joining the network. But um, we have to sort of find a balance between that openness, but also the to, we have to make sure that who runs a, a node is uh, has at least some experience in running node or uh, or managing servers and stuff like that, because it's not. A simple thing. It's not just putting up a node and and let it run. I mean, it's a, it comes with some responsibilities. It comes with upgrading the 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 software when new updates come out, and uh, you know, voting for proposal, being active as much as possible in the community. So, it's a uh, yeah, it's very good to have that sort of balance between staked and uh, and also experience uh, of the node runner. Okay. Um... It makes sense. Thank you for thank you for clarifying that even more. Um, I think that was the the last question. So um, I just want to thank you, uh, Michael, the other Michael as well, the entire Phantom team for for this event. It was really fantastic for us to uh, to have you here. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully, we'll have even more students who will watch this recording later on. This kind of had a few conflicts with our online classes, but still the turnout was pretty great. And uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much everything from us. Um, very thankful for, for your collaboration with us. I don't know if you guys would like to add a few uh, final words uh, on the event. Sounds great. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you very much, Alejandro, for organizing this. Thank you, everyone, for, for attending. It's been, yeah, very... Uh, we love doing this, so it's uh, it's been great. And uh, feel free to reach out, as Michael was saying. You know, uh, we have quite a few uh, positions open at Phantom, uh, mm -hmm. both as developers and non-technical uh, positions as well. So feel free to reach out, and uh, yeah, let, let's see, let's let's do something together. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we'll definitely be sharing all this information, all these resources in our Telegram group. So this has been amazing. Thank you so much once again. Good luck and uh, 
short future and long-term future to the entire fans and team. Uh, we can wait to hear more updates uh, from your side. Uh, don't forget, we'll have more events uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Friday about this uh, blockchain week. And uh, that's all from us today. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Perfect. Yeah, thank thanks you. A lot. Bye -bye. Yeah, once again, thanks for organizing this. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye.